So now that you've got it, it working with that brief hands-on, we'll just do a quick bit about the placement of the MP1 and where it fits into ST's portfolio and where it <coughs> might fit into your products as well. So those that of you who have worked with the STM32 in the past or even just looked at our website will know it. STM32 has been around for quite a long time. In fact, it's been around for 12, just over 12 years. So we launched it in, over in 2007 with the uh, Cortex-M3 STM32 F1. So we've been around for quite a while and we've gradually been increasing the portfolio and adding more functionality to the devices, improving them, widening the, the availability and the use of them. So whether that's with the, the general um, or the mainstream products like the, uh, the F0 and the F3 there. The ultra low pr power products in the, in the green, which are designed for um, battery powered devices, so, so really efficient in terms of power. Or the high performance devices, which are the ones in pink, so the F2s, the F4s, the F7s, the H7 that we launched last year. Um, and now adding to the high performance side is obviously the MP1, so we're adding in even more performance with, it, with the dual Cortex-A and the M4 as well. So it's been around for quite a while. We consider all the STM32s uh, general purpose, so not application specific. We've got, with the exception of a couple of parts which are dedicated towards particular applications, generally speaking, they're application agnostic, so the general purpose designed to fit, to be able to, for you to be able to find the right device, regardless of what your application is. One of the key things about the STM32 is if you design it in today, or for, for any micro, uh, if you design it in today, will it be around when you come to production? Will it still be around when you're still producing that same board in five years' time, eight years' time, ten years' time, etc.? So it's obviously a key question. For the STM32 products, in fact, for a number of the products um, within ST's portfolio, we do offer a, a longevity commitment of ten years. That being said, it's a minimum of ten years. It's a rolling commitment. It's not from the day we launch the product, it's 10 years. Um, it's a rolling commitment that we refresh January every single year. So when you take the product, the F1 that we launched in 2007, we're still offering 10-year longevity commitment on that today. So eventually that means a minimum of 22 years commitment to that product. So if you design it in, it's going to be around for, for a considerable period of time. And that includes the MP1 that we're launching. Well, we've launched now. So in terms of where it fits and, and, and where the MP1 comes from, the key thing is, is the reuse of the STM32 uh, ecosystem and infrastructure, and making it familiar to anybody that's already using the STM32. So from that point of view, if you consider this inner box here as a standard STM32, so any other microcontroller that you might have used, with an M4, all the STM32 peripherals in there, all the connectivity, and the same ecosystem that you may already use today for the Cortex-M based products. So if you use Kyle or IAR, or you use System Workbench as your development environment, if you use Cubamex, any of those tools are all still applicable to the MP1. And if you have a team, or if you yourself develop firmware for a Cortex-M based product, you develop it in exactly the same way for the MP1, as you always have done. And you can take the, the binaries for that, drop them into the file system for the MP1, and load the firmware from there. So the development process doesn't change for the firmware for the Cortex-M side. Then on top of that, obviously, we need to add, for an application process, we have to add the Linux ecosystem and the infrastructure. So we've got a dual Cortex-A7 in the product um, with 3D graphics as an option. Um, the DRAM interface, obviously, because you need DRAM for the for the device, and then the Linux ecosystem, which in, in our case is based on Open Embedded and Yocto. In terms of where it fits into products and your products and the market, as I say, all STM32s are designed or intended to be general purpose, therefore no specific end application in mind. So from that point of view, in terms of possible applications, it pretty much fits in wherever you want some either increased performance, or whether you just want the flexibility of being able to use a Linux-based product so you've got the access to the drivers and all the, the functionality with it. Maybe you've already got applications that run in Linux, and so it makes them easily portable into, into the MP1. And then on the developer profile side, as I say, already MCU developers will be familiar with the environment because it doesn't change at all. And then you've got MPU 
people that are familiar with MPU or Linux development, which again should be familiar with the ecosystem we, we're presenting because it's, it's very similar. It's based on standards. Um, it's based on the standard tools, so open embedded, Docto, etc. So it should be fairly easy. To, if you're familiar with the Linux environment, it should be fairly easy to pick up. In terms of the feature sets for the MP1, one of the key things is the peripherals that are available. So although you've got the Cortex-M side and you've got the Cortex-A, so you've got effectively the Linux and the real-time parts, the peripherals aren't or fixed. We haven't determined which peripherals map to which side because that would make it inflexible. So we allow you to map the peripherals to wherever you want. So if you want Ethernet on the Cortex-A, then you can put Ethernet on the Cortex-A. But on the other hand, if you wanted it connected to the Cortex-M, you can do that. If you want the I squared C on the Cortex-A, you can do select that, or you can map it to the M4. Your choice is up to you and the tools. We've, we've enhanced, we'll see in a minute, we've enhanced Cubamex to allow you to do that mapping to the tools of the peripherals. DDR interface, well, it's, it supports DDR3, DDR3L, LPDDR as well. So you've got a choice, and 16-bit or 32-bit wide. So you've got a choice there on, on what uh, memory you can map. And on the flash side, well, pretty much all, all flash types are supported. And what's more, you can boot from any of the flashes you choose. So whichever flash type you choose, you can, you can select to boot from it. As I said, there's a display interface so on, the, on the higher end product. There's MIPI DSi as the display interface, and the 3D GPU is available as well on that higher end product. And then, of course, because it's an STM32, a lot of applications require analog interfaces, ADCs, DACs, etc. So we have those as well available. When it comes to doing the design, powering is obviously important to the device. So you've got the power sequencing for all the different power rails to support the, the MP1, but also you've got power for the different peripherals. So you need to power your DDR, you need to power your USB interface, you need to power your Ethernet Fi, etc. So you need to, you have all that to consider. To make it easier, the partner division of the uh, microprocessors has produced a, a PMIC for the device, a companion PMIC for the device, which will give you all the power sequencing. It will provide the power for all your um, peripherals on the board. So it makes it an easy solution makes it one chip solution to to power the board and power the all the devices that being said you can still do a discrete design and we have a reference design for the pmic and for a discrete solution if you want um, so the choice is, is down to you so i mentioned graphics graphics is an option on the mp1 uh, so the the board you have obviously has the graphics on board otherwise you wouldn't have a the nice 3d graphics that you have on there now it is the uh, vivanti ip that drives that for the 3D GPU, it's called the GC Nano, uh, supporting OpenGL ES2 and uh, OpenVG as well. It's net, one of the reasons for choosing it is it's natively supported by Linux, so we haven't had to write any drivers for it. It is already supported um, out there. It does support alpha blending as well, so if you've got complex graphic solutions that you need to put together with layering, it can do that as well. In terms of resolution, we're talking about WXGA up to 60 frames per second. So a reasonable quality for an embedded uh, processor. And then you have a MIPI DSi if you want to use a MIPI DSi as your interface for the uh, displays. So the, d the displays you've got on those boards are MIPI DSi based. Ecosystem wise, I mentioned already, it uses the same ecosystem, or certainly for the Cortex-M, it uses the same ecosystem as all the other STM32s. So that's STM32 Cube with CubeMX and Cube Programmer. And then hardware-wise, so from an SC point of view, the ecosystem is, is the software, the hardware, and the support infrastructure that we put in place for, for an SCM32. So hardware-wise, we've got the discovery board. So you've got the board you have, which is the DK2 on your board. So that's got the graphics. It's got the uh, combination of BLE and Wi-Fi module. Um, the SCM32 MP1 on there has the hardware cryptography enabled on it. There is also another board, which is the DK1, which I have over on the demo table, which is the same base board. It just doesn't have the display, it doesn't have the Wi-Fi module, and it doesn't have the hardware crypto-enabled part fitted. So it's a slightly cheaper option. Then we have the eval board, which is somewhat bigger. Lots of connectors on it for connecting to stuff. Not quite as flexible for prototyping. So I would, I would recommend if you want to prototype, 
really the DK1 or DK2s are the way to go. But that is an option if you need either the bigger display or you need just to be able to easily plug various things into the peripherals. Then on the customer side support, so the information side, the MP1 is supported by the same global support network that STM32 already is. So that's our online support, the commun ST's com community for S STM32, our FAEs worldwide, our distributor FAEs as well. And then we also have a partner program. Now the partner program becomes more important for the MP1 because obviously with it being at Linux, there's a whole load more. It's not just about consultancy for hardware design or low level drivers design. You've got lots more layers to consider. So we have many partners associated with the hardware design, with low level driver software design, middleware design, application level design, that kind of thing. And also partners that produce things like SOMs. So if you don't want to do your own design, you can take someone else's design and drop those into your product. This slide pretty much summarizes what I've just already said, to be honest. Uh, so the eval board, the big board, you know, probably the most expensive option to consider for your development. Um, two flavors of it, again, uh, one with, with and one without the hardware cryptographic engine enabled in the device. A couple of options on the discovery board, which we've talked about, and then SOMs and other boards. So you've got manufacturers making SOMs, but also other reference designs or development boards. So for example, the Lanaro specification for 96 boards. Um, there's a number of uh, third parties actually developing boards based on that spec, whether it's the IoT spec or any of the others. So you can go out and, and pick up those boards as well to, to do development with. And you'll notice on the slide that the pricing for the, the discovery boards have an agreement with our colleagues at Avnet to allow you to actually purchase the board at a discounted price. So if you follow the link that's in the slide or even just use this search number or this part number on Avnet's website, you can get a, a decent discount off the price of the board. MP1, the development tools, what we changed in terms of the existing tool set. Cubamex is our configuration tool for those that don't know. So it allows you to do the alternate function mapping of the device, set up the uh, PLLs, all the clocks, generate the initialization code for the boards or for the firmware. We've enhanced it to allow you to, do, to map the peripherals between the Cortex-A and the Cortex-M. So that's the first step. So you can choose where you want the peripherals wheels to be connected. But we've also added in, as part of that, device tree generation. So for Linux, you need a device tree to configure the peripherals and, and, and map them. So Cubamex will generate the device tree for you so that you can just import that into your projects. Also, another important part is the DRAM tuning. So obviously DDR, high-speed interface, needs some critical tuning in order to function at its best. Cubamex has a facility in there to allow you to do that tuning to get the, the best performance out of it and then save the configuration to load into the device. Tools-wise, or compiler-wise, etc. For Cortex-M, it's exactly the same. So you use the same tools as you already have done. So whether that's R, uh, IAR, Kyle, so on the paid solutions, the free solutions from System Workbench, or other Eclipse-based tools, etc. So AC6, System Workbench, Eclipse-based tools as well, generally. Um, or even uh, just command line GCC-based tools, you can use those. When it comes to uh, the Linux side, for this workshop we're using the AC6 tool to do all the, the compilation. Then Cube Programmer, we have Cube Programmer, which we've enhanced to support MP1, so we're adding in, OTP, it has OTP programming based in, so there's a lot of OTP available to put your own parameters in within the device. Uh, so any you know, MAC addresses, that kind of thing, programming into them. So you can do that from Cube Programmer. If you have a situation where you want to sign binaries and encrypt them, Cube Programmer can do that for you and create those signed images as well. I'll skip that slide pretty much. This covers what I've pretty much said. So in terms of simplifying your Linux development, obviously there's a whole lot out there. It's a complex package to be involved, to be involved with and to use. There's, there's lots of different drivers, lots of different combinations of things. So we've tried to simplify it by one, pushing everything up into the community. So we've up, upstreamed pretty much all the software. So you can go out there and just find it. You don't need to come to us. You can download it from kernel.org. You can download it from our open GitHub repository. Um, the code down. So that's the first thing. And so all the code is supported by the community as well as us. We've tried to, where possible, in fact, pr pretty much 
we have to if we're going to put it out into the community so we're fully compliant with all the open source standards where we need to be so we've uploaded to the linux foundation we've, we've covered by the yocto project so we're part of the yocto project if, on the secure side we use opte so again another community-based secure solution so not something specific to st not something proprietary pretty much we've gone with open source solutions for everything so just as a reminder, I think we've said this a number of times, the key benefit on the, the Cortex-M side is you, the reuse. So you benefit from you using everything that's already out there. If you have code already written for the STM32, you can recompile that and run it on the, the MP1 on the Cortex-M. So you don't need to redesign from scratch. So you can use the APIs to access the peripherals. So that whether that's the, the STM32 QPAL or the low layer, which many of you may be used already, um, you can reuse those. Middleware components that we, we already showed for the Cortex-M, again, reusable. You can learn from many of the examples that we have already in the packages. So when you download the firmware package for, say, the M4, there's loads and loads of examples in there on how to use the peripherals. So they're all still very relevant. And we go through a continuous cycle all the time for quality. So taking in field reports, bug fixing, adding features, recycling the firmware and making sure we're con constantly updating. And the final point on their business-friendly license as well. Uh, from our point of view, for the Cortex-M, everything we, we give out on our website has always been free of charge. We are STs in the, in the business of selling chips, not software or, or anything like that. So the drivers are all free of charge. The middleware source code that we provide is all free of charge. The schematics and the Gerbers, we provide those. You can free to copy them. You know, you can copy and, and use pretty much as you like. And that now extends into, onto the Linux side because everything is covered by standard Linux type licenses. So whether that's GPL of various flavors, BSD, etc. And again, Chris has got a slide on what the licensing terms mean. So which types of MP1 being, if you've looked at the STM32 portfolio, you'll know we have hundreds of different numbers. So from a few different product lines, we have thousands of part numbers because we can take something like the MP1, and in this case, as a headline product, we have right now 24 different products in, in production because we do different flavors of it to suit different customers' needs. So starting at the top, we have the MP157, which is the device on here. So you've got the dual Cortex-A7s with the Cortex-M4, with the 3D graphics and CAN-FD and the uh, MIPI-DSI as well. Then we step down to the 153, which again has the dual Cortex A7 and the M4. Uh, we can FD. This time we don't have the graphics. So if you've got a product that needs the performance but doesn't need the graphics, then you can drop down to the 153. And then the lower end, if you're looking for a Linux infrastructure, an application type product, but don't necessarily need all the performance of the dual Cortex A, then you can go down to a single Cortex A with the M4 still. So the M4 is, is still there giving you the, the real time sign. So that gives you three product lines. For those, you can have hardware cryptography within the product. So you can have a variant with and without hardware cryptography. And then finally, we do it, all those products, so the six different products in four different packages to suit your design requirements. So whether it's four layers, boards, six layer boards, whether you support laser wires, plate through hole, etc. on the PCB, you need to be able to do 0.8 pitch or 0.5 pitch on the VGAs. So you've got all the options. And as a note, the, the 10 by 10 is currently the smallest dual Cortex-A based product on the market. So we talked about, I mentioned partners, how they're, they're important now to the P1. Um, this is just a small subset, a, a snapshot of when we, we made these slides right back at the start of the year, February. It's growing all the time. But you, the key is you can see we have, we have partners available for training, for the embedded software, for the higher level software and engineering surfaces, actually for, for the software development tools, hardware design, and then SOMs and SIPs. So we have a number of partners producing MP1 based SOMs and SIPs. Uh, as I say, that's growing all the time, but if you need help of any particular partners, or indeed if, if you're a consultant yourself and want to, to be involved in supporting people using our products, then you can go to our partner program either to find a partner or to, to request registration if you want to become a partner of ST uh, for this product. MP1 is the start. 
it's the first entry for the micros division of ST into microprocessors um, in terms of mass market microprocessors. Obviously, it won't be the last because you've seen how the roadmap grows. We will be continuously implementing new products. So whether that's an increase in performance features or, or security or even products to reduce the cost and reduce the power consumption of the device. So we're currently focused on, on two different avenues for, for the next generation of products.